They have appointed a task force way back in 2003 to study the problem of pay inequity, uh, gender and race, and ethnicity in New Mexico, and the legislature had done that, uh, created the task force as a limited uh, life entity. They did an excellent report. Uh, it pinpointed all of the problems and uh, many solutions that were uh, they were putting forth. The problem with it is there was so much in it. Uh, even I, as a lifelong advocate for women and a person who knows a lot about the pay equity problem, when I saw that report, I was overwhelmed. And you just felt like, my God, we can't do all of this, so we can't do any of it. And therefore, it just fell into a black hole. Nothing ever happened to it. When I came to New Mexico, I came, um, at, well, I came and went to work for Bill Richardson's uh, presidential campaign. And he was very open to um, a women's platform. We wrote one, it was very progressive, uh, more so than uh, some of the other more leading candidates. He was the only guy that would always talk about the Equal Rights Amendment and pay equity without being asked by the moderator. Um, and so after we folded our campaign, uh, I asked if uh, he wouldn't like to do he something really wanted to really be cool. a leader in the pay equity problem uh, in solving it, and we wanted to do something besides just talk about it and, you know, put out another report. And he even said to me, we were in complete agreement, he said, I don't want another report. We've had reports. I said, don't worry, we're going to do something really bold, and we have. Now, what we did was a two-phase thing because the first thing we recognized was our goal was to get people uh, and entities who want contracts with the state of New Mexico to give us uh, pay equity reports. And it's something that business was expected, uh, private enterprise, to resist mightily uh, because in oftentimes it would be a prima facie case for Title VII lawsuits, as some of you in the room who are attorneys know. But we decided to get them to do it. We had to do it first. I'll try to be real quick about how we did it. Um, we didn't want them to say, well, how can you ask us to do this when the state doesn't do itself? So we did a study of all 19,000 uh, state workers. And we only did gender because we discovered that race and ethnicity had, had always been voluntary as far as the employees to disclose it. Uh, we have a very high Hispanic population in our state, but not everyone with a Hispanic name is Hispanic. Case in point, our state director of uh, personnel was a woman named Sandy Perez. She was carried on the rolls as Hispanic because the clerk guessed, and her husband is actually the Hispanic in the family. So we knew that that data could not be um, trusted, so we decided to confine it to gender only to begin with. Uh, we were well aware of the need to expand it, and uh, if the politics ever lend themselves to uh, that expansion, which we hope in us if they will, we will we'll include it. But anyway, we did that study. Uh, we put it out there on the governor's website and in the press. So we were able to say, we've done this, we know how to do it, and we are going to help small business do it. And we designed, and words matter, as you all know, words matter a lot, an incentive system for contractors uh, to give us pay equity reports. It was not a punishment system. It is an incentive system. And we did some Q&A for the governor in case he was asked questions. And um, one of the questions was, well, does every business in New Mexico have to do this? No, the answer is no. Only those that want a contract with the state. <laughs> because uh, it's our taxpayers' money. Taxpayers are female and male alike. It will be good for the economy of the state when people make what they should. We turn them into taxpayers. Uh, we save money on Medicaid, food stamps, and so forth. So we constructed classic liberal arguments but uh, that would serve the objections of the business community. We took about eight months. Uh, we fast-tracked it because the governor was term-limited 
and we wanted it, um, in, in our words, embedded in the bureaucracy by the time he left office so that it would not be easy to get to just overturn it. And uh, even though we have a conservative uh, Republican governor now, she has so far chosen to leave it alone. Yeah. She is a woman from a, uh, she was a prosecutor, a non-traditional field for women, and she is female, she is Hispanic, so we're hoping that she's gonna leave it alone, she has so far. Anyway, we, uh, it took a lot of bureaucratic um, procedure to do this. You can't just declare it, you have to publish it ahead of time. You have to go through a lot of procedure uh, to put the requirement on contractors. But it is now embedded in the bureaucracy. It is a requirement for every entity with 10 or more employees uh, to submit a pay equity report along with their uh, RFP response or their invitation to bid or if they are on um, uh, purchase orders, if they reach $20,000 in a year, they have to give us a report. Uh, we designed it so that it was gender neutral in the sense that we took the view that the state of New Mexico cannot uh, make a judgment that a pay gap that favors women is okay and one that favors men is not. So we designed it so it's an absolute percentage number pay gap, it does not say whether it favors women or men, we're neutral on that, but we just know if there's about a 40% gap, who's probably at the losing end of it. Uh, the same is true for publishing uh, salary data. Uh, we wanted to get around that objection that we were uh, compromising worker privacy or proprietary information. So we constructed a set of spreadsheets that allow the, uh, and they're not optional, uh, they have to use our spreadsheets and formulas, but in the end, what it spits out is these these percentages. They get to see their own dollar amounts and so forth, of course, but we let them keep that in their, in their office and let them fix it. I know our time is limited. We started late. I'm going to just take questions now. I know this has been fast, but uh, let's open it up and maybe we can be more informed. Hi. Um, I think you might just want to explain that they're giving those percentages in the nine broad EEO1 occupational categories. Yes, thank That's you. That's what they're reporting uh, on. One of our, our, our real guiding principles was we have to make this simple enough that uh, we won't get a lot of blowback to use Joe Biden's word. And uh, so we decided to use the EEO1 categories and make the case that many of them, especially Intel, for example, is our largest employer, they're already <coughs> reporting at the federal level. They know these categories. Uh, many of their administrative folks know them. Uh, so that's what we're using. And uh, we built those into our spreadsheets. They're downloadable. For, we have a whole website in the state government that tells them how to do it. Um. What happens when they submit the audits? Is there a, the, the, the reports? Is there a number, like a percent, five percent each year that will get audited? Or if you see a big gap, is there follow up? Uh, there will be follow ups. Right now, we're taking the view we want to take 12 to 18 months to see what we're getting. Uh, we want it to be uh, more institutionalized before we actually start auditing. But we did build into the initiative the uh, right for the state to audit it through the state auditor's office. He has oversight of, over it. I've talked to him a number of times about it. He is very interested in it. Le coming out of that process, we will then uh, devise an, a point incentive uh, scheme where those that have lower gaps hopefully will get more incentive points than those who have very wide ones. We're not there yet. We're doing this small steps at a time. We are getting so little resistance from business, it, it's really amazing. And we think part of the reason is that right now, it's just a form they fill out and check off and, and turn in with their invitation to bid or RFP. Nothing happens to them. Now, hopefully, <laughs> they'll look at it and say, my God, you know, i got to fix this uh, if they have large pay gaps because as we know there are, there are remedies uh, that individual women or classes of women can take but right now uh, we're just easing them into the requirement. Uh, I 
am in talks with the Women's Bureau about trying to uh, educate folks around the country about what we did. One of the things that, that we knew, and that came out of a lot of Washington experience on my part, when this first came up, the governor said, why don't we put in a bill? And I said, because you're not going to get a hearing, much less get it out in the time you have left. We know that. We've been fighting this for, what now, 18 years with the Fair Pay Act. And it took almost that long with Paycheck Fairness. So you're not going to get a bill. Let's try to go around and do it some other way. Uh, I think the other um, lesson we learned, Lisa, and AAUW was certainly instrumental in this, is that you have to have the advocates behind it. We met with all the groups. We told them to um, be sure and talk it up with their members of the legislature so that if an attempt to block it came up in the legislature, uh, we weren't sure that legally they could even do that, but they had tried it with the governor on a, a health insurance thing, that we would um, we be protected. We went to the attorney general, and we said we would like a ruling on whether this falls within the scope of the governor's power, uh, because we knew that the Republican legislature would probably take that tack as well. We got a prior ruling, but we just headed off all that. But we do have to have strong advocates on both sides of the aisle, hopefully, uh, that can help us. Uh, they need to know that women want this as much as the bureaucracy uh, wants it. And so that was a lesson. Starting small, uh, it would be great to have race and ethnicity uh, and even age, but you've got to be practical what's possible. And also, you have a lot of state employees that have to do this. Uh, you have to make sure they don't just view it as one more uh, burden on sure. them if they, they didn't sign up. Uh, Martha, I'm just trying to understand, is the information public? And then I have a second question. It, did you need to do an executive order or did, did you just get, you know, you went to the Attorney General and others, did, did you do it some other way? Is there some written document that lays this out? Well, it's interesting, Holly, and an interesting question. We got an executive order appointing a working group the governor declared pay equity a, a, a priority for the state of New Mexico. And then the executive order appointed a working group, which I chaired, to figure out how to do this, how to require it of contractors and do it uh, for the state um, workforce. So we did it. We put it in. The executive order had the goals in it. We went ahead and did it as a working group, and then the working group more or less went out of business. So in a certain way, there's nothing to overturn. I mean, she could overturn the, the exec order that says it's a priority for the state of New Mexico. I don't think there's any political upside to doing that. So it's an open legal question now as to what would happen uh, if, some, if a future governor did try to overturn it. We, think, we hope it will be like 11246, that nobody's going to want to touch it. Uh, once it's embedded in the process. And we think that some contractors that have complied uh, without complaining and, and completely uh, would object if now in the future their competitors do not have to do it. So there's that side. Is it public? Yes. Uh, everything that um, accompanies an RFP is public. And it is uh, part of it. Uh, unfortunately, we are uh, still Luddite in terms of our electronic uh, ability, so it's all paper. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyone can go <laughs> in and look at it. <laughs> um, and we, we were working fiercely uh, at the time of the election to make a way for the, the state tax uh, online tax filing system to allow them to also file this. That infrastructure is all in place, but unfortunately we were not able to implement it before the election. So I, see. I'm I sorry, know I'm that to follow. time is limited but. and uh, we need to stop now, but I'll hang around after if folks have other questions. And thank you again to IWPR for giving me this opportunity. Yay.